Good evening once again and welcome to another program of Issues in the News where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in our country over the past week or so. And I want to begin by uh, saying good evening to the, all the persons on the Region 5 side of West Coast Barbies, Region 5 West Coast Barbies, stretching back to Mahaika, Maikoni, Abari, all those persons who are joining us on television, good evening. I want to welcome also on board the persons on the eastern side of the Burbies River, persons on the eastern side of the Burbies River, and of course, along the quarantine coast, good evening. Those people are joining us on television, and I want to also say good evening to all the persons who are joining us on Freedom Radio, uh, from Rob Street, Georgetown, good evening, and I want to say good evening also to the persons who are joining us on Facebook right across the length and breadth of Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, and across the world. Welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in our country. And I want to begin also by updating the country and updating all of you in relation to my experience and technical difficulties here. Okay, I was being distracted there shortly, I thought. Anyhow, we are back on. So I want to discuss this evening at length the issue of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I want us as a people, as a country, to recognize what is happening in Guyana, in the Caribbean, and across the globe as we continue to struggle to survive this pandemic. Now, I am told that in the United States of America, a thousand persons are now dying per day with the different variants of the virus that are now out. In the Caribbean, the hospitals cannot take off the number of patients that are at the doors of the hospitals. There is a shortage of uh, oxygen across. So I was reporting that throughout the Caribbean, there is a shortage of uh, oxygen in hospitals across the region and hospitals across the region are, are having difficulties in admitting into their care the number of persons who require medical attention and admission by virtue of the COVID-19 virus. And that is happening throughout the Caribbean. In Guyana, we have a situation developing where we are grappling with, uh, fortunately, we still have a sufficient supply of oxygen and we are boosting our capabilities at the emergency unit of the hospital but we are very running we are running very close to having a situation where we may not be able to handle the level of demand that is building up in our country and that is how that is where we are with the covid-19 virus every day the government is coming up with new measures. Every day, we are increasing our capabilities to battle with the situation. But every day, there are new challenges. I have said over and over again, and 
political leaders across the Caribbean and across the globe have said over and over again that this virus knows no politics. This virus knows no ethnicity. This virus knows no race. It has the capability and it has demonstrated the potential of destroying any human being that it comes into contact with. So far, the only thing that has proven to put a setback against the penetrable nature of this virus is the various vaccines that the different companies have put on the world market and made available to people across the globe. It is the only thing that has provided some type of response against the virus. And the result has been a remarkably positive one with very few persons who are vaccinated are succumbing worldwide to the virus. What that means is that the virus, the vaccines, sorry, are working because very few vaccinated people are succumbing to the virus. And that is a universal, global, statistical fact. That ought to establish beyond any rational doubt that the vaccines are working. And that is the global position. In Guyana, we have been fortunate to have had from the inception a government that has been totally responsive, efficient, competent in the management of the situation, and when compared to the rest of the Caribbean, has performed, I believe, a distinction. And most importantly, has been able to secure from various countries an adequate supply of the vaccines available. And we have been able to, I believe, successfully so far, been able to disseminate that vaccine or those vaccines with comparative success, so much so that we have surpassed 60% of our population being vaccinated. I think that that is a remarkable achievement. I also believe that we can do more, and I'll go, I'm going to deal with that as I go on. We would like our children to go back to school. We would like normalcy to resume in our society, and we are doing everything that possibly can be done to achieve that objective. But that is a work in progress, and it is going to be a challenge. We have now begun vaccination of our children. And the ministers of health and education have done exceptionally well in the outreaches that they have held in order to have our children and teachers and teachers vaccinated beginning last weekend. And we are making tremendous progress as I speak in that regard. 
as if to put a damper, as if to undermine, as if to betray all the efforts, as if to destroy all the successes that we have achieved as a country and as a people. Three trade unions, the Guyana Teachers Union, the Guyana Public Service Union, and the Trade Unions Congress have come together and have approached the High Court to quash the government's vaccination policy in relation to this program. And I pause so that that news can sink in. The Guyana Teachers Union, the Guyana Public Service Union, and the TUC have come together and they have hired a lawyer named Darren Wade and they have filed proceedings against the Attorney General in which they are seeking to quash the entirety of the government's vaccination program, including all the government's guidelines, all the government's uh, rules in relation to testing, all the government's protocols and guidelines in relation to the opening of buildings, etc. In other words, the sum total of what they are seeking to do here is to stop the government from going forward with a vaccination program, period. In other words, we must not vaccinate Guyana and Guyanese. Now, in your quiet moments, I want you to internalize, absorb, reflect upon the magnitude and gravity of what I am speaking about, the impact of what this action seeks, the devastation that it can cause in our country, the mayhem and chaos that it can perpetuate, the level of death and disaster that it can permeate, let all of that sink in. And you understand where we are in Guyana and how backward the political opposition is. Because let me say up front that these three unions are nothing else but fronts for the APNU AFC. This is the APNU AFC attacking the government's vaccine program by three of their satellite apologists organizations and through a lawyer who is obviously a member of theirs he was a candidate on their list so they are not even intelligent enough to fashion a proper disguise so that is where the opposition in Guyana stands in relation to the vaccine program this, what they are doing here, is an act that can lead to genocide. This is an attack on human rights. This is a human rights tragedy, what they are attempting here. That is why when we in Guyana speak about an opposition being destructive, people who can't relate, People, rather, who do not, are unfamiliar with what we are speaking about, cannot relate. And the world could not relate until they saw what happened from March the 2nd, 2020 to August 1st, 2020. The world couldn't believe. They couldn't believe. That is why that former Prime Minister of Jamaica said that it was the most transparent attempt 
to rig an election. It is, that is what the people were speaking about. They never saw anything like that. The world is now viewing what an opposition is doing in a country that is hit by a global pandemic. The opposition now is, goes to the court to tell the judges, stop the government in its efforts to vaccinate. Stop the government in its effort to fight this disease. In other words, let the people die. Let the people perish. Let the destruction continue. Let the human tragedy take place. That is what this action is designed to achieve. And I want people in their living room and who are following this program to understand that. Let that sink in. And let me tell you something else. The leadership of the opposition are all vaccinated. The union leaders who are named here, Coretta McDonnell, Lincoln Lewis, and Don Gardner, I am betting my last dollar that they are also fully vaccinated. Darren Wade, the lawyer, I am prepared to bet, is fully vaccinated. But they want the ordinary supporters of theirs. It is their supporters that they want to be decimated. And that I want to slowly explain so that you absorb it that is the quality and type of leadership that they offer to their own constituency here is an outstanding example of them attempting to decimate their own constituency and these are the people who want to speak about exclusively representing an ethnic base. And whenever any person attempt to represent this base, they label those people racist. They must, they must represent this ethnic base. And look at where they are leading the ethnic base. Look at where they are taking their own supporters. Like Jim Jones. They are feeding them the Kool-Aid. And that is what is happening here. I also want to pause to explain to you that this government, the PPP Civic Administration, inherited a set of COVID guidelines promulgated by President Granger when he was president under the Public Health Ordinance Act, they promulgated it. And all that we have done is that we have continued to modify, to alter, to add, to subtract, and to amend the very set of guidelines that they have initiated. And now they are saying that Mr. President Granger was wrong, that he didn't act properly. So they are going back to challenge their own. And that is another example of their constant hypocrisy, duplicity in relation to anything that they do. They asked for the recount, and then they did not, they wanted to repudiate the recount when it didn't result in their favor. They asked to use an ID card in 1997 elections when they lost 
they repudiated and they went to the court to challenge the result of the elections. And I can continue to give you examples of where they sat, they make arrangements, they commit acts, they make decisions, and then subsequently they challenge those very decisions. And that is what you see here. The gazetted order that they are seeking to challenge, which was published, was basically a republication of that which President Granger had made under the public health ordinance while we were in the opposition. And they are asking, they are saying they got Yubraj. Yubraj, and I spoke about him recently, they got Yubraj, he seems to be a doormat. So they pick him up and they mop him up with their feet. And they have the Braj swearing an affidavit to say that he is a member of the Central Board of Health. And he, either to himself or his representative, never sat and met and made these orders. But the orders were made by President Granger and continued by us and modified by us. But I don't want to go too much in the merits or the demerits of the case, but I just want you to understand the impact of what they are asking and what they would like to see happen in Guyana. So if they win this case, the government must shut down the vaccine program. We must allow everyone to don't wear masks. We must allow everyone to go into schools and and everyone to do what they like. We must remove all regulatory framework and the country must continue as normal as though there is no pandemic. That is what the sum total of this action is. In other words, let us all die. Let us all die. That is the effect of this action. You see, when I tell people that we have an opposition who are simply incapable, incapable of representing a single person in this society, people say that, you know, I am too much political. I am not. I have said over and over again, we need an opposition that is vibrant, effective, and sensible. What we have is a motley crew of persons who I am not sure any longer have their mental health intact. And you see the evidence of it in the actions that they have fired. You cannot be in control of all your senses. You cannot be in control of all your faculties. And go to the court to ask for the orders that you are asking in this case. That is what we are confronted with in Guyana. And the world must recognize this. The world must recognize what the people of Guyana are exposed to. We have something that is more dangerous than the COVID-19 virus. It is the leadership of AP and UAFC. And they believe that they are so bright and that they are so intelligent that nobody would see that this, what they have filed in the court, is them at work. Under the pretense of the thinnest of disguises. Is them at work. So let us see how far they will get with these proceedings. The law in this country is very clear, as it is in most civilized countries, that yes, the Constitution guarantees 
what is called a scheme of Bill of Rights to individuals as fundamental rights and freedoms or inalienable rights of the individual. They're all described by different adjectival labels. And you are guaranteed that as a human being in every civilized country. They include the right to life itself, the right to liberty, the right to enjoy private property, the right to enjoy a freedom of conscience and religion, the right to worship, the right to strike, the right to demonstrate, the right to associate and assemble, the right to be protected by the law, the right to be protected against discrimination, the right to travel and move, and a whole set of rights. You, all, you have them all. But you know what the law says? The, the greater law says that all these rights, none of them are absolute. In other words, you can't enjoy these rights absolutely. So while you have a right to drive and to move freely, you don't have a right to drive up a, a one-way street. You don't have that right. While you have a right to speak, you don't have a right to cry fire in a crowded theater. So every one of your rights is, must be juxtaposed against others. And you must have a, a balance. So while you have a right to worship, you must do so in a manner that allows the man next to you to worship and worship differently. It's called coexistence. It's called, it's called a balancing of competing interests. That is how civilized society functions. When you have all these rights that are com competing, but you're able to balance them. And you know what? These rights are for the individual. And if there is something that threatens the life of the individual, the law says that the state in which these human beings live can take such actions that are necessary to protect that life. Because without the life, then you have no freedoms and actions. So, for example, if the life of that country is threatened by a pandemic or a public health order, a public health hazard, sorry, the law says, the constitution says, the very constitution says that gives you those rights, say that look, in the public interest, in your public health, we can compromise those rights. We can restrict those rights for the public good. And the guidelines that are issued across the globe, not only in Guyana, are issued from that jurisprudential perspective, from that juridical basis. They're not done by politicians who sit down one day and abstractly come up with an idea that we will take away the right to enter a public building. No, it comes out of a process that the law recognizes and the law authorizes the restriction of your freedom of movement. You have a freedom of movement to travel from one country to another, but try to travel without a passport and you will see what will happen to you because the law again has restricted your right to travel across international borders by imposing certain restrictions. Your right is not taken away. It is being regulated for the public good. You have a right to travel and you have a passport, but you will not be allowed to board a plane unless you subject yourself to security clearance. You can't tell the people you have a right to travel. You have a fundamental right. Yes, you have. But you have to comply with the restrictions of subjecting yourself to a search 
to ensure that others enjoy a safe travel. The same thing that you want. You don't live on an island. And that is how the law is interpreted. That is how the law is constructed. And that is how the law is applied. And that is what, how, how society is governed. So when the Minister of Health in Guyana issues those guidelines, is that the PPP want to restrict and the PPP is imposing political restrictions? They are born out of public health concerns and they are authorized by the Constitution. And everything that our government has done is being done right across the English-speaking Caribbean and indeed the rest of the world. The rest of the world. So I just wanted to spend some time in elaborating on the travesty of these court proceedings and I hope that our listeners get now the clearest possible understanding of how destructive, how vicious, how callous, how cruel, how inhumane, and how criminal perhaps these proceedings are and what the consequences that these proceedings can lead to, the devastating consequences, so that people can appreciate the mentality of those who are fronting, as well as those who are backing these proceedings. That these proceedings are politically sponsored and centrally directed by some sick and pathetic mentalities. That is what I will say at this point in time, and I will say the rest in the court because they have sued the Attorney General as the lone respondent. That's what the excerpt of the proceedings say in the press as they are being reported. Now I want the government continues with its cash grant program for farmers. We started in regions five and uh, six, and then I believe we continued in region five, and I believe that we are continuing in region 10. As I speak, I think I, I spoke with a Bishop Edgil, and he is up the Demerara River in Region 10, where he is distributing the grant for farmers. We have made it abundantly clear that we don't have a perfect system, that this is not like the school cash grant program where you have a register of every student in the public school system, that we had to go on the ground using public servants employed by the agricultural ministry as well as other government and state agencies to construct a register of persons affected. That that register may not be accurate, that we will continue to subject it to verification and other scrutiny to ensure that it is sanitized as far as possible. That when people complain, we must say to them that we are working and cleansing the system. And we are hoping 
that we get the cleanest possible system, but most importantly, that the program continues so that we can distribute the monies that we have promised. But we have put people in the system who are working in the system, who are fighting among themselves and between themselves and with persons who are claiming to be affected. And that is what is timing the program from proceeding smoothly. So I don't know, I called for the Ministry of Our, Minister of Agriculture this afternoon. I didn't get him. But we certainly have to look at the complaints that are being generated and from whom they are being generated. Because I believe that we have put some people to work in the system who are contributing to the wickedness too. And I have received reports of persons who are working with us, with the government, and are contributing to the misleading information that is in the public domain. So we have to do some introspection on this program, of this program, to ensure that we don't, that we, 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 we run a clean operation. That is the objective. The objective here is not to hustle anybody any money. It's to ensure that as far as possible, persons who are affected get their monies. The truth of the matter is, when we had announced originally, and persons must, must speak the truth too, when we had announced that we will do this program and we will distribute cash grant and assistance for our farmers, a lot of people did not believe. A lot of people did not believe us. They did not believe that this will materialize. And they never took our appeal seriously to put their names down into a system that we were building. So they ignored it. And when they saw the monies actually being shared out, then there was one big helter-skelter scramble to get their names in the system. And that is the truth. And those of you who are listening to me, in particular, in Barbies, etc., you will know what I'm speaking about. Because many of you told me, and told the minister that, that you all didn't realize that this thing will come to pass. You all believe that it was some kind of political rhetoric. So you didn't put down your name first. And when the thing actually started to happen, then there was this desperate attempt to enlist your names on that register that we are trying to create. So I wanted to assure farmers and their families that we are working assiduously to build a credible database and we are continuing with our outreach to distribute these vouchers and we are endeavoring to do so as fairly, as equitably and as um, authentically as possible. And we are ensuring as far as possible that genuine requests and applications are processed and granted. I want to also take the opportunity on this program as I am broadcasting to the quarantine coast to extend my deepest condolences to the family, to the relatives, to the children, to the loved ones of the Pandit, popularly known as Harry Bowl, who was brutally killed Saturday evening in his community at Crabwood Creek. Many members of his family have reached out to me on Facebook and have requested that I visit the home. I have not been able to do so as yet, but I will try to meet with the relatives as soon 
as possible. I wish to take this opportunity to condemn this act of murder as a senseless expression of brutality. It shows how primitive we can be. It shows how dysfunctional perhaps our society is. As I said on another program, it will be comforting to none were I to report that the statistics show that there has been a decline in crime, in serious crimes, and in violent crimes. There has been a decline, and a marked decline too. But that will bring comfort to no one. Because the perception out there, what the people are feeling, is that crime is on the increase, and they are feeling unsafe. And when you have this act of brutality, and this expression of insanity, Manifesting itself, it sends the message straight home. I have spoken recently a lot on mental health in this country. And as a government, we are pursuing several programs that will bring mental health of our population into focus. We have several programs within the criminal justice system that will shed light and bring focus on the mental health of persons who interact with the criminal justice system, either at the level of the police station or at the court or in the prison. It cannot be normal social behavior for the pundit to go out there with a piece of wood and, I suppose, attempt to assault persons who are drinking. And it cannot be normal behavior for persons who are drinking on the road to behave in such a manner that would cause a pandit to react in that way. And it cannot be normal social behavior for either parties to choose violence of this type to resolve what appears to be a simple civil difference. This, this, this is not normal behavior. These incidents, in my humble view, exhibits great evidence of mental health issues. And we have to tackle that frontally in our country. And we are beginning to do that in a serious way. And that brings me to speak about, when I spoke about mental health legislation, I spoke about mental health programs that have to be administered and that we are constructing one right now. I am working with experts in building a program for the penal system of our country that magistrates can use when they are considering sentences, judges can use, that the prison facilities can use, that the public health system can use, when it the issue of mental health arises. And it's not only in the penal system, it's right across the length and breadth of our country. So I wanted to take this opportunity to condemn this act and hopefully I will be in Barbies in, I don't want to predict a time when I will be addressing or be meeting with 
these persons, the police, uh, sorry, the family members of these persons, um, the, the pandit who was murdered. I see somebody's asking, I'm reading a couple of, um, I've said to you that I'll try to interact by reading some of the comments that are coming up. And someone is saying that, A.G., perhaps you never live next to a rum shop. I, I believe that the person wants to tell me about the noise nuisance and the behavior um, of, of persons who are in the vicinity of a rum shop. I know that. I grew up in villages that have rum shops, like every other village. And I know the type of behavior that takes place. And I am saying, I am here condemning that. And I'm saying that we have to pay, pay a closer look to this situation. And of course, I'm getting a series of messages about the police and the police inability to react, etc. And that continues to be a problem. And we are continuing to, to, to tackle that. We have sought monies from the National Assembly and we are in the process of assembling a quick reaction group that will be functioning in every divisional headquarters. Both the President and the Minister of Home Affairs will be speaking more elaborately on those matters. So, yes, we continue to work every day in building the capacity of the police to respond to crime and to respond to what is taking place in our country. But as I keep saying, this is a societal problem. We can't look at this as a, as, as a, as a criminal problem alone and, as a, and for the police force alone or the government of the day. This is a problem that is, that is pervasive. And I suppose a lot more has to be done involving civil society and civil society type organizations. Somebody is, and that's the other thing that takes place in this country. Every time one speaks, what one says is distorted. That is why I try to speak very clearly and very candidly so that what I say is at least difficult to misquote. So President, Vice President, sorry, Vice President Bara Jagdeo in an interview which I heard said that one must be mentally retarded for one to believe that the March 2nd elections were rigged. Now, that, that is a very fair statement. You have to be retarded to think that those elections were rigged. That was turned and twisted by David Hines to say that Mr. Jack Deo said that coalition supporters are mentally retarded. Jack Dave never said anything like that. Heinz may be mentally retarded for thinking that way. A lot of people said what Mr. Jack Dave said. I said it. And I can repeat it. You either had to be part of the thiefing cabal if you believe so that and, and then in your defense you make up a story and say that it, the March 2nd elections were rigged, or if you seriously believe that it was rigged, then you are retarded. And nothing is wrong with that statement. I endorse that statement. Let me repeat. If you think that it was rigged, then you are mentally retarded. If you say that it was rigged, but you don't think that it was rigged, 
you are simply part of the thievery because you are fabu fabricating an allegation. So I, I, I just wanted to say that to respond to some message that I'm reading on the, on the comment section about what someone said about Mr. Jack Dave and what Mr. Jack Dave said. Anyhow, we are quickly running out of program time and this is where I have to say good evening and goodbye. I think that we have had a good discourse and we have to look forward to how this these legal proceedings will unfold. They are very important. I ask you to follow them closely and let us see how our judiciary will react to the contentions advanced by these uh, umbrella organizations masquerading as unions representing the best interest of our Guyanese people. They are not. I believe that they are acting in the most detrimental interest of the Guyanese people, but that's a matter for another time as we have to wrap up here now and I want to take this opportunity to wish you all the best for the remaining of the week and stay safe. The COVID virus uh, is intensifying. It is manifesting itself in the different variants and we now have to up the ante in our efforts to combat what obviously is one of the worst global pandemic in living memory. I want to thank you very much for sharing the past hour with me and may you enjoy the rest of the evening and the rest of the week and may God continue to bless you. Thank you very much.